Praise God. Um, just a few notices. I think oh, I've got them. I put them somewhere. Oh, yeah, they're gone. They're wrote about. They're wrapped in. Uh, <laughs> you wrote to us and you don't even remember something. No, I had a, a thing. Next Sunday morning, for those that, uh, I won't say feel like it, but those who are motivated by the Spirit, there is a combined church's Easter sunrise service at the Beagle Lookout starting at 7 a.m. When I first got the notice, it said six. It said six a.m. and I thought, oh, you know, I thought daylight saving was still on. But yes, it is. So it's seven a.m. up on the on the lookout there. So you are invited to share a sunrise service, and it's good that all the pastors, including me, are actually involved in the service. So it's one of the ways in which you know we can. Be together, hallelujah. And 9 till 11, there's a Christian Easter show on radio, and then I'll oh. come back after here. Right, after after 9 to 11, 9 11 Easter 11. show, that's on 97.3. 93.7. Oh, 93.7. And you can live stream it, so you don't have to have a radio. Yeah, right, praise God. Uh, also, uh, Home Fellowship uh, this week will be on Zoom again, and uh, welcome there, get the details. Promise, or if you don't like zooming, you can come to our place and you can watch it with us in the background. Amen. Praise God. Well, hallelujah. A word. A word. Well, you might remember last week, uh, Marion's message on praise was opening up the way to, to victory. And I want to follow up this today by considering God's provision for us to live in freedom and in victory. Amen. And it's good, the word, that communion, I felt, was really focusing on the victory that we have in Christ. So thank you, Angie. Now, I'll put a question to you. How many of you have had a mortgage or significant loan repayment? Don't all put your hands up. Yes. But, right? Yes. How did you feel when it was paid off? Oh, set free. Off? That's right, set free. You know, many homes in Sydney uh, are in excess of or close to a million dollars. You know, a place that <coughs> was sold for a hundred and forty-seven thousand or hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars in nineteen ninety when did we go to Gosford? Nineteen ninety six? The last time we were aware that it had sold, and this was a few years ago, was nearly five hundred thousand dollars. You know, now if that's out in Mount Druid, and I just had a look at an old real estate magazine, and they were all showing how wonderful homes were at two, three, four, seven, twelve million dollars. What? You know, uh, not in Mount Druid. No, it's not Mount Druid. No. But the thing about it is that that. For most people, the burden of debt is a form of slavery. Yes. It's interesting that Proverbs 22 7 says, the borrower is servant or slave to the lender. And we know that when the nation of Israel was in, was in Egypt, they were slaves of the Egyptians. And then they, they were delivered, God delivered them from slavery, to free them from slavery, but he also established a system that was able to provide deliverance again and again to live free from slavery and from debt and keep their inheritance. And this was established by Moses through the declaration of a jubilee year. And when Jesus started his ministry, you might remember when he went into the synagogue of Nazareth, he announced that he was the fulfilment of the jubilee. And I'll read this, the scriptures to you. Luke 4, 16 to 21. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and it was given to him the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, 
to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And we know that this scripture was fulfilled by Jesus and his ministry demonstrated the outworking of the prophetic word from Isaiah. But that word is for every Christian believer today. Jesus gave his instructions to his disciples, he started off, gave his instructions to his disciples to demonstrate the jubilee. In Matthew 10 verse 1, it says, He gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. And then in John 8 36 said, Therefore if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Now I believe this is uh, this year in the Jewish calendar is a jubilee year. Now, I've, I've tried to look it up, I was told that. Um, but although the Jews don't celebrate the jubilee anymore, the principle of jubilee still applies to Christians today. Now, I'm going to briefly outline what the year of jubilee was, why it was important to God, and I want to consider a number of amazing promises of the Jubilee for Christians today. Amen? There are three elements to the Jubilee. Firstly, it was to be a year of rest because God would provide. Leviticus 25, 11 and 12 says, You shall have the 50th year as a Jubilee. You shall not sow, not reap its aftergrowth, nor gather from the untrimmed vines. For it is a Jubilee, it shall be holy unto you, you shall eat the crops out of the field. Why could, the, why could they rest? Well, it had seemed a challenge for that society because at the time, basically, they were pretty much subsistence farmers. They, would, uh, they, they depended on the annual harvest for their survival. Those who would plant, get the harvest, eat, that would keep them going for the next year. The Jubilee was to, year was to be a time of rest for the land, and God said he would be their provider. But, and the way he would give, be their provider, he actually said, I will give you a threefold harvest in the one year before Jubilee. And the people actually had to trust God that he would do what he said. Because, you know, okay, we're not going to sow. Uh, we, we can see that ahead. We're not to sow in that year. What's going to happen? Well, they would sow the normal stuff in the year ahead and they would get a threefold harvest, what God said. I just wonder, they had to trust God for that? I wonder, how do we go trusting God in for a short time when we might be facing a time of need? Amen? Mm. I'll leave that as a question. But I believe this also is linked to Malachi 3.10. I'll just throw this in. God said he had opened for us the windows of heaven. You know the rest of it? If we give him our time. That's right. The second point about uh, uh, Jubilee, that God hates slavery and the slaves are freed. Leviticus 25.10. Moses said, it shall be a jubilee to you, and each of you shall return to his possession, and every person return to his family. The jubilee year was to be a year where Israelites, who were bond servants, that is, they were in slavery, or, or uh, yeah, I suppose in slavery, to the fellow Israelites because they owed money that they couldn't pay back. But the thing is, they were to be released from their debts and able to return to their home in the year of Jubilee. They had to be freed. And I just wonder, you can see the picture here of Jesus on the cross, paying the price for our sins. Our debts were wiped off. Okay? We're delivered from the slavery to sin. Amen. Amen. That is, by accepting his saving grace, we receive freedom and sonship into the family of God. So by accepting that, you know, I, I just wonder, there might have been Israelites there, said, oh, I don't think, you know, the weather doesn't look too good, you know, we'll, we'll sow in the Jubilee year just in case God doesn't turn up, you know. And I just wonder, sometimes as Christians, we have that mentality. And the third thing about a Jubilee year, that debts are forgiven. 
And as I said, the Israelites were freed from being indebted to, to, to masters. And Jesus actually told a parable to this point. It said in Matthew uh, 18, 21 to, uh, to 35. And he said, you know, we should give, forgive others because God has forgiven us. And I think you know the story that a servant was had an incredible debt. He went to his master and he said, I can't pay, you know, forgive me. And the master forgave him. But then that servant went out, grabbed another servant who owed him a little amount, took him by the throat, I think it is, and said, pay me up. And the servant said, I can't. Uh, okay, get thrown in jail. And the point of the parable is that no amount can pay for our sins. No. Amen. But God has forgiven us through the sacrifice of his son Jesus on the cross. Therefore, of course, it comes back on us. We should forgive anyone who has done something against us. Amen. Amen. And with the Jubilee, every generation could be delivered. Uh, and with that deliverance came seven promises. There were seven promises with that that are significantly important to Christians today. And these are the promises I want us to take hold of. And this sort of was a allude when, when uh, Angie gets communion about things that we, we can claim, the promises that we can be healed, we can be delivered, we can be blessed, you know, all those things, that they are promises that we have through Jesus. But the first promise that was made in Leviticus 25.10, it says, Liberty, liberty, it says, You shall make holy the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout the land, to all the inhabitants thereof, and it shall be a jubilee to you. You know, bondage or slavery of any kind is a cruel master and not of God. You know, many people today are actually in bondage. Bondage. And the thing is, to much, maybe it could be financial debt. Could be drugs. It could be lust, could be pornography. Could be alcohol. You think there are many, many things. And people may be in the grip of a habit or a burden that they just cannot get free from uh, without divine intervention. Experiencing a jubilee is to have Jesus answer their cry for help and reach into their lives and it's through his shed blood that he can set that captive free. Amen? I remember hearing a testimony of someone who really was into, uh, well... The depths of, I'll call it respectable sin. He was a businessman, and uh, uh, but he was into all sorts of things. And he said that when he, through a miracle, he became a Christian, but it took time to realise all the things that he was dealing with in his life, you know, the drugs, the sex, the, all the other things, actually had to drop off. And it was as God gave him a progressive revelation of these these things. But God set him free. Amen? And that's it. Praise God, Jesus is setting captives free. So that's the first thing in Jubilee. Liberty. We have liberty. The second part or second promise was total restoration for your family. Leviticus 25, second part of verse 10. Every person shall return to his family. You know, as a part of returning to his possessions, a Hebrew slave was able to return to his family as a free man. And the homes were uh, restored through the Jubilee. The homes were restored. And we know, of course, today many families are split. Uh, many families are broken. And there may be children. We you know, may have children ourselves who have strayed away from the family, strayed away from God, and have been captured and imprisoned by the devil. 1 Timothy 2.4 4 says, What is God's will? God's desire is that all should be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus, of course, added to this in John 8.32, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. But Pilate, I suppose if you want to give him some credit, at least pose the question to Jesus. He said, well, what is truth? Well, the thing about truth is that we say truth is a person. Yes. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. You know, it's God's plan that uh, people, individuals, families,
come to the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus, and that they be saved and they be restored, not only to a heavenly father, but to their natural family. So I believe this is saying, let's, let's keep praying and believe for our lost or straying family members not to, to give up. No one is so far gone that they cannot be reached by the Spirit of God. We pray that they will come and be restored into the kingdom of God. Amen? So that was the second one, restoration of family. <coughs> the third promise from the Jubilee is increase from the field. Leviticus, Leviticus 25 12 says, For it is the year of Jubilee, it shall be holy unto you, and you shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. Now in, the, in that day, slave owners were the ones who owned the property. And uh, they had the money, they ate the best of the field, and it's increased. Slaves basically had the leftovers. Praise God, we are not meant to survive on leftovers. Hallelujah. The outcome of walking in God's way and not following after the world and delighting in and meditating in God's word is shown in Psalm chapter one, Psalm one, verse three. He said, "He that is the person who follows after God, he will be like a tree planted by rivers of water that bring forth its fruit in its season. Its leaf will not wither, and whatever he does will prosper." Uh -huh. It's interesting. The, the Hebrew word prosper here is called salic, which means to cause to be. Uh, cause to go on prosperously. Certainly the context of that verse is to prosper materially, but God wants us to prosper spirit, soul and body. And we need to note that the Jubilee year, that they still, uh, uh, the, that for the Jubilee, that they still had to sow. Right? They still had to sow beforehand. It wasn't a case, oh, we're doing a Jubilee year, we've been sitting out sit in our seats and look at the sunset and everything will happen. No, they still had to sow beforehand to get a crop. The principle, no sowing, no reaping. That is a principle applies across the board. And this applies also, of course, to our giving. Whether it's, you know, tangible things, money, time or whatever. The principle is no seed sown means no harvest. God's not being mean when he says that. He takes what he, we sow and he multiplies it. Yeah. There are parables about you know, things multiply. When we sow them, they multiply. So there is an increase from the field that is one of the yeah. blessings of uh, Jubilee. The fourth promise here is possessions. Leviticus 25, 13 says, In the year of Jubilee, you shall return every man to his possessions. You know, during the Old Testament times, Israelites who owed money could be held by their creditors until the debt was paid. But in the year of Jubilee, they had to let them go to return debt-free to their homes, to their families, their possessions, were restored to them. You know, Satan wants to keep us in slavery and bondage, but Jesus came to pay the debt of sin and set us free. Amen? John 10.10, 10. you should know this one. The devil has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. And I believe that as believers we need to take back all what the devil may have taken for us, whether it's family or possessions or whatever. Amen. There is a, a school, um, school of gospel, I was principal of, and they uh, the Holy Spirit really had visited the school the year before we came. And uh, the, the chapel service they had were really live, jumping, shouting, waving Pentecostal services with the students. It really was something. But one of the songs that they had, uh, it says, I went to the dead enemy's camp and took back what he stole from me. And they'd all go, I went to the enemy's oh, camp yeah. and I took back what he stole from me. And the whole... 600 kids <laughs> we do that you know, really was fantastic well God's promised us in his word and as, as Angie referred to this in healing deliverance peace 
Restoration. <laughs> and Satan is going to try and do everything to keep you from receiving what God has promised and keep you from doing what God wants you to do. You know, I'm sure those in bondage to their masters uh, would have known when the year of Jubilee was coming up. And they would have, I would imagine, reminded their masters, year of Jubilee, coming up next year, and you know what that means? It means that I can go free. You're going to give me back all that you've taken. Jesus has announced our Jubilee, and he's come to re release us, to free us from whatever may have held us in bondage, and in his name we can walk free. Amen. 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 Praise God. The fifth promise is freedom from oppression. Yes. Leviticus 25.14 says, If you sell something to your neighbour or buy something from your neighbour's hand, you shall not oppress one another. There is an old saying, I don't know, it might have been a chorus, that said, We owed a debt we could not pay, and Jesus paid the debt that he did not owe. Amen. You know, it is, I'll say it again. We owed a debt that we could not pay, but Jesus paid the debt that he didn't owe. Amen? You know, as I referred at the beginning, when you look at the real estate market in Australia today, especially in the major cities, how much is needed to buy a house? You know, it's not a palace, just a, a house. Three bedroom, five room house in some of the suburbs is over a million dollars. And of course, this is causing financial oppression for many. Yeah. But the thing is, the greatest oppression anyone can have is sin. And of course, it has eternal consequences. <coughs> Jesus is our jubilee when we accept his salvation. <coughs> our debt pay, our debt of sin <coughs> is paid by his blood and we are set free. Mm -hmm. right? Set free. Isaiah promises, that he says this, you will be far from oppression. Isaiah 54, 14. In righteousness you shall be established. Jesus is our righteousness. You shall be far from oppression, for you shall not fear, and from terror, for it shall not come near you. In Christ we are free from sin and the oppression of the devil. It's in Christ. Galatians 5, 1. Paul spells this out. He says, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand fast, therefore. Do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Yes. You know, we've been set free and God has given us the means by which we can stay free. But we have to make the decision, living for Christ, not to get tangled up again yeah. in the things that had us bound. Yeah. You know, it's... Uh, you know, if, you, if you've had a problem with alcohol, I would suggest that you don't say test out your faith and sort of walk past the pub open door and wave to your mates inside, right? It's, it's uh, you know, you might get tangled up somewhere there. Yeah. Likewise, you know, in terms of people who had pr uh, problems with maybe pornography and not... Uh, well, I'll just have a look. Just I'll have a look again, just to show that I'm strong enough to turn it off again. You know? No, doesn't we? We have to make that decision. Whatever maybe has had held in bondage, we cut off and we turn our back and go the other way. Amen. The sixth promise from the uh, jubilee, Leviticus 25:18 says, "Wherefore you shall do my statutes and keep my judgments and do them." And you shall dwell in the land in safety. Hallelujah. The Hebrew word for safety is betak, which also means confidence. What God has here said means that we can be confident in his word of provision and protection. But as with all of God's promises, they are conditional. And the condition was that the Israelites keep his commandments and statutes. But, you know, we know from history, reading the Bible, that they couldn't do it for very long. And as a result, their enemies were able to attack and defeat them. God is able to keep you safely. Right? God is able to keep you safely, but you have to walk in his way. 
And it, oh no, I was going to tell an Irish joke, but I won't, I'll be able to learn that. We have to walk in his ways. You know, but this doesn't mean that Christians will never suffer persecution or hardship. God will always keep his promise in Hebrews 13, 5 and 6, where he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Right? He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So, so yes, God will keep us safely, right? but then he will keep us safe even through persecution. It's interesting about keeping safe. I remember hearing a story of a well-known British evangelist who was here back in the 19th century. That seems a long time ago, doesn't it? Right? It's, uh, um, yes, we're, anyway. But th this particular story is a well-known British evangelist was on, uh, doing a, an outreach and he was travelling by train, I believe it was to the west country of England, to hold these meetings. And he got to the platform and had this strong conviction of the Holy Spirit say, don't go on this train. Well, you know, he looked at his watch and thought, well, if I don't catch the train, I'll be late. You know, and I just, you know, what, what are they going to do for my meetings? You know, I won't be there for the first meeting. But as he argued with God, and there, there was a little argument that went on about, you know, he was just getting put off by the devil, he heard the voice again, don't go on this truck. So he said, all right, if it's the Lord, I'll do it. Anyway, he went back to the ticket office and was changed, changed his ticket for the next one, which was later in the day. But that train, on its way to the West Country, derailed at high speed and many people were killed. So we need to listen to the voice of the Lord. He will keep us safe, right, through whatever. And the believers who listen to the Holy Spirit and obey will be protected supernaturally. I know in the back of your mind I was thinking about this, what about the people who are persecuted, hearing them? Well, God keeps them safely. And even though they might lose their physical life, they are eternally secure. Right? The, the purposes of God, we, we often can't work out, but we know the word is secure. He will keep us safe for eternity. Amen? And the final uh, promise from the Jubilee is triple blessing. Right? Triple blessing. Leviticus 25, 21 says, Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and it shall bring forth fruit for three years. You know, God is no man's debtor, and he has commanded his blessing upon his people. Think of the verse, Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the Lord, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is anyone who hangs upon a tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, that you might receive the promise of the Spirit through, you know, through faith. You know, just as the Israelites had to plant in that sixth year for their harvest and believe that God would keep his word, we need to plant by faith our prayers for the lost in our valley, straying loved ones to come into the kingdom of God, and also we need to believe as we sow, then God will provide the harvest for us to reap. So my encouragement is, let us, with faith, keep on planting into the kingdom of God with our time and our resources and our motivation to maintain our intimate our closeness with him. Amen? Amen? God is faithful to his word and he will multiply his seed sown. Paul wrote about this in 2 Corinthians 9, 10, 11. He said, Now he who supplies seed to the sower and supplies bread for your food and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness so you will be enriched in everything to all bountifulness which causes through us thanksgiving to God. Right? That is, it will cause thanksgiving as God provides for us. So I believe... And, you know, you're probably thinking, oh, you know, sounding like some preachers who are into this sort of stuff. But no, 
I believe, well, let's claim for the triple blessing, triple harvest in one year and blessings of the Jubilee. And Amen. seven of them, let's believe for them. Amen. Start claiming those seven blessings for yourself and your loved ones and our community. Amen? Yes, Lord. Because one of the things that God's uh, choosing the people of Israel was so that the nations around would envy them and want to know how come they're doing so well. We cause them to be jealous, but obviously they failed on that and also they tended to keep them themselves uh, rather than blessing the nations round about them. God blesses us so that we can bless others. Amen? That is the purpose. Amen. God blesses us so we can bless, bless others, whether it's materially or, or uh, mental support or that support or whether it's physical support, uh, spiritual support in terms of prayer for our community. So we need to start claiming these blessings, these seven blessings for ourselves, for our loved ones and for our wider community. And as I said, if we declare them by faith, and let's see what God will do in this Jubilee year. Amen? This is the year of Jubilee. And I think some of us, many people in the spirit, are just aware that God is moving, things are happening worldwide that seem to be coming together. Amen? So let's do it. That God, it's a Jubilee year, yeah. and we are going to enter into it. Uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So praise God. Amen. Praise God for that. Amen. Jubilee year. Right here. So hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Father, that you uh, have given us Jesus, Lord, our Lord and Saviour. Father, to bless us with fellowship with you, with relationship with your Father, Lord. And Father, that you have met all of our needs according to your riches and glory. We thank you, Lord. Amen. We pray, Father, that we be faithful harvesters in this year of Jubilee. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God. Praise God.